Okay, so welcome back to the last talk of the morning. Um, so we have Emmanuel Broyard, who will be speaking about random character varieties. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I will talk about random character varieties. So what I'm going to be concerned with is a presentation. So I have K generators and R relators. So the, the WIs here would be words uh, in uh, X1 plus minus one. Okay, plus one, one. Okay. Um, and they, ha they will have certain length. And typically, I'm going to be interested in the case when the WIs have a length roughly the same length, L. And so throughout the talk, K and R will typically be fixed. And I'm going to be interested in the following question, kind of questions. So uh, given a semi-simple league group or algebraic group, G, um, so the question is, does gamma have uh, representations, so homomorphisms, in G uh, with large image, so I would assume with Zarsky dense image. Right, so, so of course this is this depends on, on the representation, depends on the group, um, and in general it's very hard to be able to say anything if you're given, given a presentation, uh, whether there exists a non-trivial homomorphism or whether there exists a homomorphism with a large image. Um, but I'll try to, to give some, some ideas of how one can approach this, uh, this question. And um, I won't be able to say anything about any concrete group, but I'm going to be uh, able to say something about a random group. And when I talk about a random group, I fix K and I will choose the relators at random. So this is a common theme uh, in, in geometry group theory since form of, um, okay, so let me start. So this is my presentation, gamma W. W bar is the tuple of relators. I have R relators. And uh, I fix K and I, I will choose the, the relators W1, WR at random, independently at random, uh, choose them according to the same distribution um, in, this, in the ball of radius L, so in, in, the, in, the, in the K the graph of the free group. So typically, I'm going to choose them to have the same length. Uh, this is what uh, Gromov does, okay? So the Gromov density model is, um, is this situation where you choose your presentation at random um, and you choose the number of relators uh, to be quite large. So you choose 2K minus one to the D times L um, relators at random. Okay, so in, in the sphere of radius L in the free group, so then if you count how many words of length L you have in the free group, reduce words, you have typically 2K minus one to the L, roughly. So if you take 2K minus one to the DL, where D is some number between zero and one, that's quite many of them, and D is called the density. Okay? So this is, this is called the Gromov density model. We choose the presentation according to, to this uh, distribution. Okay. So we have a random presentation, therefore a random group, random finitely generated, finitely presented group. Okay. And then there is what's called the few related mod few relators model. It's the same thing, but instead of two taking that many uh, relators, we just take R to be fixed. Okay. Fixed number of relators. So, so in particular, if you have a fixed number of relators, then the density is zero, or very, very small. 
So asymptotically zero. So that's, um, this is the situation. Um, so what's known about the, the about random groups is they have been studied quite a lot since the 1980s. Um, so, um, well, so we know, for instance, the, the following fact, if the density, so that's in the GROMOB density model. So if the density is sufficiently small, less than one over 12, then the group has small simplification. So it's a, it's a condition on the generator, gen, on the relators that shows that the relators don't have much overlap. And, and it implies many interesting properties on the group. In particular, it's a GROMOV hyperbolic group. Um, uh, so this, this condition has been studied in the, uh, already um, in the 50s and 60s before the introduction of hyperbolic groups. It's kind of an ancestor to the theory of hyperbolic groups. Anyway, random groups, that's very easy to prove, uh, this first line, it's not very hard. Um, the second line here is that in fact, as soon as D is less than one half, then the group is infinite and hyperbolic. So this was, uh, I think this is a theorem of Gormov, which um, uh, whose, you know, whose proof was written by Olivier. And, and um, on the other hand, when D is bigger than one half, your group is trivial or Z mod two Z with very high probability. Um, and when I say with very high probability, in fact, the, the, the set of exceptions to this is a very tiny set of presentations. The, the, um, the probability that it does not happen is exponent, decays exponentially fast when L goes to infinity. So, um, and then when, when D is between one half and one third, then uh, the group has property T, this is the theorem of Gormov. And again, uh, the proof was written by Juk. I mean, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the way the, the proof, uh, Gormov's proof is really only sketched. So. Um, and when, when D is bigger than the zero, then, then also uh, it's a theorem of Damani. Uh, Przyczyski and Girardel, that uh, the group has property FA. So this means that whenever it acts on a simplicial tree, it fixes a point. Um, and there is a more recent uh, fact, uh, the theorem of Kozma and Lubatsky, that says that whenever the, the density is positive, then the group has basically no finite dimensional representations. When you fix the dimension, if you fix the dimension like GL2, GL3, and you ask, uh, is there a nice representation? Then, well, typically, no. Typically, it's going to be trivial um, or will have a very small image. So, however, we have to be careful because uh, there is here a, a wonderful uh, consequence of this uh, great theory developed by Wise, Ego Wise, recently. In recent years, uh, we, we, we know now that every C prime one of a six group is a linear group. Okay, so this is a combination of a long series of, of work uh, by these people. And, and so it's a linear group and not only that, but it, it's actually embeds in, into uh, uh, right angle artin groups that embed into GL and Z for some very large N. Okay? So each, of, each one of these groups actually embed into uh, GL and Z but N is going to be very large. It's going to depend on L, going to depend on the, on the choice of the relators. Okay. So this does not contradict the, the Kozma-Lubatsky results, which fixes N. Okay. So um, some few, few e e easy fact. So in the few relator models, few relators model, if R is less than K, then you have fewer relators than generators. So it's very simple to see that you must, that typically you will typically have, um, you will map onto Z. Um, uh, because, yeah, because you basically are going to, um, yeah, to have a random walk and, and, uh, um, and the probability that it goes back to the identity small, so yeah, you're going to map onto Z, not going to be, a, yeah, not going to kill all the generators. Um, and, 
And so in particular, you have non-trivial representation to GLNC. Okay, so now uh, also very easy is, is the fact that uh, if you fix a finite group, um, then for any R and K, then the, the probability that you map onto the finite group uh, is actually a positive probability. Because what do you need to do? You, you need to say that W1, WR are, are one in, in the finite group. So you, you start a random walk on the finite group and you ask what's the probability that you, you know, to, to, have a, to have a homomorphism from this group to a given finite group, you need, to, you need these words to vanish. Okay, so you, you pick generators in the finite group and you, you ask, will W1 go back to the identity? And typically this happens with a probability which is one over the size of the finite group. So it happens with some positive probability and same thing for, you know, uh, R of them. So you're going to have, with some positive probability, you will map onto the finite group, okay? So this also gives you representations. Um, and, and this same idea can, is, uh, gives you slightly more. So it's, it, it, it tells you that whenever you have a K generated a minimal group, K, G, then this random walk will, this random group will map onto G with high probability, okay? And with probability with, which is, I mean, maybe not very high, but at least bigger than something that decays sub-exponentially fast in L. And, and the reason is the same because the because of what's called Keston's criterion, which is a a, um, a characterization of amenable groups. A group is amenable if and only if the probability that the random walk goes back to the identity does not decay exponentially fast. Okay, so that's a characterization of amenability proved by Keston in the fifties. Um, and so if you if you if you know that and you have our relators. Uh, then um, the probability that your uh, random group map onto your amenable group is going to be at least sub-exponential. So it's not going to be zero. So you will have some, some image, okay? All right, so these are very general considerations. And uh, now I want to show something in the uh, other direction. So, um, so here's the first uh, theorem. Um, so here I'm going to make this assumption in red here that R is bigger or equal to K. Okay. So if I have more relators or at least as many relators than relations, then, sorry, than generators, at least as many relators than, generation, than generators, then the conclusion is that um, in each dimension, the this random group will basically not have any large image. So every homomorphism from the random group to uh, GLN, that's GLNC here, uh, will have virtually solvable image. Okay. So you will not find, so the, in particular, the, the answer to this question will be no for a given G. And for all the, 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 the presentations of this form, when I choose at least as many relators than generators are at least K, and I choose the, the, the relators uh, randomly among words of length L uh, with a set of exceptions, which is very tiny, exponentially small. And so we have to assume uh, the Riemann hypothesis for this uh, to hold. So I try to, to explain uh, in the talk where, where this comes in. So let me recall here that uh, for linear groups, uh, you know, uh, a group is virtually, uh, so a subgroup of GLN is virtually solvable if and only if it does not contain a free group. This is the T alternative. And that's also if and only if it's an amenable group. Okay, so for linear groups, a class of amenable groups and virtually solvable groups is the same. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so that that's the that's uh, the one of the uh, 
the first half of, of the theorem. Um, I'm going to show you a second half later, but this is the, yeah. So whenever you have more relators than uh, generators, then you, you, you don't have any non-solvable image. With an exponentially small property, uh, um, exponentially small um, probability of, of exceptions. So this improves on the lubowski kozma uh, uh, theorem that I stated before, because you don't need positive density, you just need at least K relators. Okay, and that's Sorry. it. Grand Riemann hypothesis. I will, I will, I will uh, explain in a second. Riemann hypothesis. Yeah. Fact. We only needed needed for uh, zeta functions of uh, Dedekind zeta functions, not for L functions. Sometimes it's called ERH, extended Riemann hypothesis. Okay, I'll explain what we need exactly soon. Um, so a corollary of this is a uh, geometric corollary is is that for any such group will never act on hyperbolic n space without a fixed point either on the space or on the boundary in space. Okay. Um, and a, a nice open problem uh, in this direction um, is to try to, to prove the analog of the damani pritzsky gradel um, theorem when you have at least k relators instead of positive density. Or do they always have property fa? So this is, uh, does not seem to, to follow from their method. This is for random groups. So gamma W, yes. Okay, so this means that the, when I write gamma W, I mean that it has this property for all Ws except for tiny um, fraction of such groups. And this tiny is exponential. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, so the, the results are conditional on GRH. So, to answer your question, uh, so what we actually need is, is the following: we need that in which you take an arbitrary number field, and you look at the Dedekind zeta function of the number field. We need the fact. We, we need the assumption. We need to assume that there are no zeros of the Dedekind zeta function in a small disk around one. In the complex plane, and the the radius of the disk has to be um, at least bigger than a small power of the inverse of the log of the discriminant of the field. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the the known bounds on this uh, are the best bound are due to Stark. We go back to seventy four, and they show that there is at most one zero Ziegel zero. In, in, in this disk, which is still slightly smaller radius than what we actually need. And if we really want no zeros at all, then it's uh, even smaller radius. Okay. So, um, so a, a very direct consequence of the theorem uh, is one of the theorem I stated uh, in my last lecture on Friday. Uh, which is this uniform non-amenability uh, of linear groups. So you see, uh, I, I stated on Friday that there is this uniform non-amenability. So this means that there is a uniform lower bound on the Kajdan constant for the regular representation of non-virtually solvable linear groups. So this can be rephrased in terms of probability of return to the identity of a random walk uh, like this. So uh, for every x1, xk, the, if the group that generate is not virtually solvable, then the probability of return to the identity is sub-exponential. Why is that a corollary? Well, because if it were not sub-exponential like this, then uh, you, you would hit the identity by something by, with a probability which is sub-exponential. And so if you do it R times, you would have a homomorphism with non-virtually solvable image with probability that would be sub-exponential. So that would contradict the theorem. Okay. Right. So so this this is a formal consequence of the previous theorem. However, um, 
this is a theorem where the previous one was under GRH. Okay, so this we, uh, we, we know this, this is a theorem. And in fact, the proof of the previous theorem uh, that requires GRH uses ideas that go into the proof of that theorem. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so this is known unconditionally and it follows from this uniform T alternative, which we discussed um, tonight. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the, 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 the theorem one, the, the fact that uh, as soon as R is bigger than K, so this theorem one was that if R is bigger than K, gamma W has no uh, non-virtually solvable image in GLNC with probability bigger than one minus e to the minus c sub n l. Okay. okay, and this was under GRH. Right, so, so this theorem, theorem one, is a consequence of a more general theorem, which I'm going to state, and which um, is, is phrased in terms of character varieties, okay? So what I'm in really interested in when I want, if I want to answer this question, is the character variety of the group gamma, the finally presented group gamma, inside a given semi-simple algebraic group, okay? So I fix a semi-simple algebraic group, let's say over the complex numbers, such as SLNC, for instance, and I consider the representation variety of this group. So this is the, the family of all homomorphisms from the, um, from the gamma W to 2G, okay? So it's a closed algebraic subset of G to the K because what is a homomorphism from gamma to G? Well, it's given by the generators. And so it's the set of tuples in G to the K that satisfy the relations. So it's an algebraic subvariety. So this is the representation of variety that uh, Ali Reza discussed in his talk on last Friday. Um, and once you have the representation of variety, then it's customary to, to make the group act by conjugation on it, and then the quotient is called the character variety. Okay? So this, this quotient is, is, is usually called, denoted by a double bar because um, it's not a set theoretic quotient, it's called the GIT quotient, but what it actually means is that we are looking at the affine algebraic variety whose coordinate ring is the ring of invariant function uh, on the, home, the representation variety, okay? So it's a well-defined algebraic, um, algebraic variety and it parametrizes the conjugacy classes of representations of, of gamma into G. So I'm not going to be interested in the full character variety, but only in what I think is the most important part of the character variety, which I call the Zarsky dense part of the character variety. And that's the open set of the character variety where the tuple generates a Zarsky dense subgroup of G. So this is an open set. If you, that's a, a general fact, the set of K tuples in a simple, in a semi-simple algebraic group that generates a Zarsky dense subgroup is a Zariski open set, okay? So um, Zariski open set, so it's particularly it's dense and the complement is the Zariski closed set. And what's the complement? So if I'm really interested in the full character variety, well, I have the Zariski dense part, which is this large open set, and then I have a complement. The, the complement is, is those tuples that do not generate Zariski dense set, okay? So if they do not generate a Zariski dense subgroup, well, then they are contained in a proper algebraic subgroup. And, and, and then, well, uh, then it makes sense to study the, the associated character variety in that proper algebraic subgroup. So it's really belong, it really belongs to the character variety of that proper algebraic subgroup, okay? So if I'm really interested in G, I may as well restrict to those that are Zariski dense, okay? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to restrict to this uh, open set uh, of, um, of the character variety where the tuple generates Zariski dense subgroup. Okay, 
So now the natural equations are the following. So um, I have this character variety of the Zariski dense part of it. I want to understand the dimension of this variety. I want to understand the number of irre irreducible co components. I want to understand the Galois action because there is a, the Galois group acts on this character variety because it's defined over Z, right? If you have, uh, if your group G is a, is a Z scheme, these, these relators are defined over Z. So you have a Z uh, scheme. So you have an action of uh, the Galois group on the components that permutes the components of the algebra of the, of the character varieties. Then you may, may ask more subtle questions. So uh, what, uh, is it a smooth variety, the singularities? And then um, perhaps is it, are there any faithful representations in this character variety? This is not clear at all. Um, and then maybe are there discrete representations? Let's say if I look over the complex numbers or real numbers. Okay. So, um, all right, so some examples, all right. so. Uh, as you know very well, if you have an irreducible high rank lattice, or SLN Z, for instance, then the, the set of representations of such a group are well known. I mean, the Margulis super rigidity theorem tells you what they are. In particular for SLN Z, well, you just have one uh, representation in the SLN C, it's the, uh, the usual one. So, so in, in this case, the representation variety is finite. And, and the Margulis superiority theorem tells you more. It tells you that the, the Galois group, in fact, acts transitively on this finite set. So in this setting, when you have a finite character variety and the Galois group acts transitively on it, uh, we say that the character variety is Galois rigid or the, or the group is Galois rigid, okay? So this terminology was introduced by uh, Alan Reed in a paper with Brightson, Mike Reynolds, and Spittler, where they showed that this group, this Bianchi group here, PSL2 Z bracket omega, where omega is a cube of, of one, is, is Galois rigid in PSL2 C. Okay. So, yeah, just one uh, representation. Yeah, so the, yeah, the, I don't know, maybe two representations, and they are permitted by the Galois group. Um, so more generally, you, you, you may, or you know, in, in this same uh, spirit, you may look at a, at a surface group, let's say a closed surface group of genus G, and you want to understand, let's say, the dimension of the character variety inside a semi-simple algebraic group. This was done by Hartman Schoch and, and the collaborators, and, and then again by Liebeck and Shalef. I think, I think Rapin Chubb did some did SLN and Liebeck Schellef did another arbitrary algebraic group. They showed that the, the dimension of the character variety is 2G minus two times the dimension of G. Okay. So this, this formula here, 2G minus two times the dimension of G is, is, the, is, is, is the obvious formula. So it's basically you have 2G um, generators and you have one relation. So it should be 2G minus one. But then you quotient by the action of G because it's a character variety. So I have 2G minus two. Um, okay, so another thing. So sometimes this, this character variety can be empty. Okay, so when the character variety is empty, what this means, this means that there are no Zariski dense homomorphisms from gamma W to G. Okay? So this is the case for the bombs like solitar group. For instance, you take this presentation, uh, then it, it's, it's never going to have any, um, any, uh, Zariski dense representation in SL2C. So, yeah, most of what I'm going to talk about um, is holds in an arbitrary algebraic group, a semi simple algebraic group. But even for SL2C, the theorem is, is non trivial. And in fact, many of the ideas for SL2C just work in general. So, um, so when G is SL2C and two generators, um, then um, we can be very explicit. And, and work out what this character variety look, looks like. So um, Ali Reza gave in his lecture, a beautiful lecture where he explains exactly what are the, the, um, the generators of the, um, uh, the coordinate ring of the character variety. Uh, so the, in the case of an arbitrary number of generators, but if I have just two generators, it's even easier. Uh, so they, they, they are so the so-called Fricke-Klein coordinates. We have the trace of A, trace of B, trace of AB. 
then it's a general fact that the trace of a word in A and B is a polynomial in the trace of A, trace of B, trace of AB. Okay? And you can work out exactly what is this open set where the, the generators generate a Zariski dense group. Well, the complement of that open set, I, I call the degenerate variety, is a union of three things of a cubic surface, this, this one here. This is the locus of reducible representations, those that those A and Bs that have a common fixed point in the in P1. And then you have three lines that correspond to dihedral representations, infinite. Yeah, if you need dihedral groups. And then you have a finite set that correspond to finite groups. So this, this finite set correspond to the, the, the you know, the atomic solids um, subgroup, finite subgroups of SU2 that act reducibly. Okay, so this is it. So in particular, you can give this to a computer and, and, um, and uh, these people here, Ashley, Burrell, and Lawton, they, um, came up with a sage routine also in Mathematica that uh, allows one to compute PW for any, so if you give me W, I, I give you PW. And therefore I can also give you equations for the character variety. Okay. So the character variety in this SL2 case has this, this very simple set of equations. So you need to, so PW is the trace. You need to say trace equals, trace of W equals two because you want W equals one, so the trace is two. But W equals one is also, in this case, W equals one is equivalent to say that the trace of W is two, the trace of AW is trace of A, and trace of BW is trace of B. We have three equations. And, and you can show that it's equivalent to say that W equals one when you are outside the degenerate locus. So the character variety is defined by these three equations minus the degenerate variety. So you can, you can, um, you can put this into a computer algebra system and, uh, um, and ask him, for example, ask the computer, what's the, what, what's the dimension of this set, okay? So for instance, if you take this um, uh, famous whitehead link complement, uh, then it, it has this uh, very simple presentation. And then you can compute the character variety. Well, that's going to be an open subset in, uh, in this hypersurface. So you can compute the, these polynomials in, in each case to get lots of examples. Um, here's an interesting example that which is due to, due to Drutru and Sapir. They looked at this word, a very simple one relator uh, group on two generators. They show that this group is reasonably finite, but not linear. A simple one relator group. Uh, and uh, Sapir developed a method to prove that some one related groups are residually finite. But they show in this paper that it's not linear. And you can give this to the computer and this will tell you exactly what's the character variety. In this case, it's just two points in SL2. It's the character variety, uh, the Zarsky dense part. So these, they correspond to Zarsky dense subgroup of, subgroups of SL2C. And what's in, funny in this example is that it's, uh, it's not integral at the prime p equals two, which um, was interested, interesting, an interesting fact to, uh, for Ellen Eno because she wanted to have such um, rigid uh, representations of finite presented groups because this, using a theorem of hers, you can use that such groups are, are not pi one of uh, projective uh, complex manifolds. Um, so, of course, these, these groups are just finitely generated subgroups of SL2C, Zariski dense, but it's not clear at all that the, the one related group they come from is faithful. So the subgroup of SL2C, it's an image of this one related group, but it's, it may not, this image may not be faithful. In fact, it is not faithful because we know it's not linear, it's the proof link. So, uh, so a very interesting question is to, to determine when can you have a faithful representation for which or for how many of those, uh, of those representations, even in the case when you have just a one related group on two generators, uh, is it faithful? When is it faithful for which W and how many are faithful? Uh, I, don't, I really don't know. The only information I have on this problem is, is this, uh, a small remark, which is that 
using the Magnus Freiheitssatz, which is a theorem on about one related groups, um, it's easy to see that if W is not conjugate in the free group to its mirror image, so that, you know you read the, the word from right to left instead of from left to right, or, uh, or to the inverse of the uh, mirror image, then this one related group has no faithful representations in SLTC. Okay. And so, th so this implies, so this condition on the mirror image, in, if you take a random, a random word, it happens very, very rarely. So this implies that for, for most words, this, this one related group, although it will have Zariski dense representations in SLTC, they will not be faithful. Um, and this relates to a very, what I think is a very interesting op, um, program or open problem is to determine um, what's called the universal theory in SL, of SL2C. So, you know, universal formula in first order logic, the formula that starts with one quantifier for, for all and no other, uh, and nothing else. So, um, and you want to determine what's the universal theory, namely what, what are all the formulas that start with for all in the, in the language of groups and that are valid in SL2C. So this amounts to, it's the same question as um, to answer this question here. So if you're given one group, one W, one word, or finitely many of them, what word, what words in the free group uh, must be consequences of this of this identity. So if you have A and B in SL2C that satisfy this W, what are the Vs in the in the free group that must be killed also uh, under the assumption that W is one? So so uh, Tilsela has uh, developed a theory to understand this same question when you replace SL2C with a free group. But it's if it's difficult, I would like to know the answer to this for SL2C. So it's, it's related to this question of whether, you know, whether there are faithful representations. If not, what, what is the image of this random group? Okay, so here we come the, the, the second and final theorem uh, of this lecture. So, so this is the, uh, the main theorem. We, uh, in this theorem, we understand um, when the character variety is empty, when it's uh, non-empty but finite, and when it's infinite, and then we compute the dimension. So we, again, so the, uh, I, I take a fix, we fix K and we fix R, okay? And we take these relators at random of length L in, in uh, among all words of length L, and for each such group, we ask what's the character variety inside a given algebraic group G. G here is still a semi-simple algebraic group. You can take SL2 if you want. So the first theorem is, I stated it, it's almost the same as theorem one, is that if you have at least K generated, at least K relators, then the, the character right is empty. Okay, so, so the, the Zaski dense part of the character right. So this means there are no image with Zariski dense image, no homomorphism with Zariski dense image in G, okay. right? Um, and this happens for all uh, relators, all choices of relators, except for a very tiny set of exceptions that may be, that is of financially small prob probability. Okay. Um, and so if you know that there are no, no, no image with, no, with Zariski dense, there is no Zariski dense image in a semi-simple algebraic group, then you see that uh, it's easy to then deduce theorem one, which was saying the same thing, that in fact, there is every, every image is virtually solvable, because if some image is not virtually solvable, there will be an image with Zariski dense in some uh, semi-simple algebraic group, okay? All right, so from, from one here, you can deduce theorem one, uh, but perhaps the most interesting case is case two here. It's when you have, when the defect, the defect of representation is, is, uh, is, is this uh, K minus R. The defect is, is the number of, relate, of generators minus the number of, of, of relators. So when the defect uh, is one, so for instance, for one, two generators, one related groups, 
Uh, then, then this is the most interesting case because what you get there is, is um, we show that the, the character variety is finite and non-empty. Okay. So this gives you uh, many uh, Zariski dense representations um, of, of this group uh, that are rigid because it's, it's finite, so it's a finite set, so you cannot deform, there's no deformation. So this group gives you um, many examples of uh, Zariski dense subgroups of SL2C or G of C that uh, are K-generated and are rigid and Zariski dense. Okay? So they are kind of the random, you know, you know random groups, uh, rigid. So um, again, uh, so so that's when the defect is one, and we show last part when the defect is is. Um, is larger than two, or two or more, then the character variety is in fact absolutely reducible. Okay? And then we have a dimension a formula, which is the same one as the one for the surface group. Okay, for the surface group, you have two G-generators and one relator, so certainly the defect is two G minus one and two. And here, the, uh, but what, I, what I'm saying is that for a random group, well, you have the same, same formula, the dimension. Not only that, but we show that the, that the character variety is absolutely reduced. Okay, over there in part two, yes, sorry, thank you. Yes, it means Galois rigid. Okay, so Q reducible means Galois rigid. So it means that the Galois group acts transitively on this finite set. Um, yeah, so two things. So first of all, yeah, the theorem holds under this GRH that I mentioned. This weakening of GRH. Um, in case two, we we know not only that it's finite, but we know that it's quite large, and we have a lower bound. We can prove a lower bound on the size in terms of L. L is the length of the relators, and we can also show that the Galois action is as big as possible, so it contains the alternating groups. So it commutes them really. Uh, Okay, so um, yeah, so maybe so this is the this is the theorem. Maybe I'll give some some uh, hints about the, the proof next. So um, so already, if you go back to the, to the proof of by Liebeck and Shalef um, of the absolute irreducibility of the representation variety of the of a surface group, uh, the way they did this. Um, is by counting. So they reduce mod p, and, and then they say, well, um, if we can count how many representation, how many homomorphisms I have for my surface group to a finite group of Lie type, like SL2FP, then this amounts to counting the number of FP points of my character variety. And Lang Vale, tells us that um, to understand the number of irreducible components of an algebraic variety, it's enough to be able to count how many points I have on FP, FP points. Okay. And I, counting the number of points will also tell me the dimension of the variety. So, so it's enough to, to, count, to count homomorphism. What does it mean to count a homomorphism, how many homomorphisms I have from gamma to a given finite group? It means to, to, count, um, to count tuples that satisfy this relation. Okay. And for the surface group, and so there is, when we have just one relator, this product of commutators, and there is a formula that goes back to Frobenius, um, he developed character theory, using character theory, that does just this. So you have a finite group, and you have this product of, of, of commutators, and this formula in terms of characters computes the number of solutions to, to, to this equation in a given finite group. So if you have information on the, on the characters of a finite group, the character bounds, then you'll be able to have a good count. And count, that's what Liebeck and Shalev did. So we would like to do the same. Unfortunately, we do not have a Frobenius formula that would count how many, how many solutions I have 
to these equations because these words are just arbitrary words. They are not um, this nice, simple product of commutators. So, so that's the reason we can't say much about any given uh, science presentation. But we are going to exploit randomness to be able to say something about most, most, most gamma. So, uh, so this is the, the idea. And so, um, of course, one key word here is Chabotaev. So uh, actually, so Jean-Pierre Serre has a very nice book, uh, this green book, that is called Lectures on NX of P. And he explains there uh, many things. And in particular, he explains how you can uh, recover uh, the dimension of a variety out of the number of points over FP. So you, you have this, this is, this is a fact. Dimension of a variety over Q is equal to the limb soup of the log of this X of P. X of P is the number of points of X, and then reduce X mod P divided by P. Not just that, but you can compute the number of Q irreducible components of your variety by averaging X of P over, over the primes, average over the primes. It's a little bit like, you know, if you take the, the polynomial x squared plus one equals zero, then you look mod p, how many roots it has mod p. Well, um, if p is congruent to one or three mod four, we'll tell you whether minus one is a square mod p. And if it's a square, well, then you have two roots. And if it's not a square, you have zero roots. So half of the time you have two roots and half of the time you don't have roots, okay? And so, which means that on average, you just have one root. And that's a reflection of the fact that x squared plus one is irreducible over Q. If you take an arbitrary polynomial over Z and you count how many roots I have mod P and you average over some window of primes, what you're gonna get, the answer will be the number of Q irreducible components, uh, factors of your polynomial. Okay, so this is a multidimensional version of this, what I just said. So, um, so of course, this formula is for a fixed x, and we would need this not just for a fixed x, but for all these x, xw's together. Okay. And we we face a techni you know a technical problem here because um, the these uh, varieties xw's so this is the the character varieties you know they are defined by uh, these equations. These equations have length. I mean, the, the words have length L, so they are very long, you know, they have degree L, typically. Uh, so so, so um, the, the complexity of these character varieties grows with, with the length, okay? So in particular, their degree is not fixed. And in everything that has been done before on this problem, you typically, in a more in cell book, you, you fix the variety, so you fix the degrees fixed, and everything is, you know, Degrees, but we want something uniform. <laughs> so we have to work more and we need an effective version of this Chabotai with con polynomial control on this, uh, on the degree aspect and the, of the variety when you change the variety, okay? Um, so that, that's one ingredient. And the, the idea of the proof then is, is to, uh, how to bypass, because we don't have this Frobenius formula, so we don't have character, we cannot use character theory. So how do we bypass that? Well, um, we exploit randomness for this. And the idea is, although we cannot compute uh, how many points we have mod P for a given W, we'll be able to count on average how many points we have mod P when you, when you, you change the W, okay? when you change the relators and take random group. So we have to, the idea is to use a kind of a Fubini argument where we average this quantity in two ways. You can average over primes in a given window, and you can average over the words of length L because it's a random group. So I take, um, I, I take a random, we, we take random words. Okay. So, um, so for, for in A, this is, this is where we need Chabot type and we need, we need to assume GRH because we need very good bounds on the error term in Chabot type that depend on the degree uh, of the number fields because the, the degree of the number fields that come up 
um, they are typically um, linear in L, so they go to infinity. Okay? And so, and, 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 and the log of the discriminant also goes to infinity. So, yeah, so the arithmetic data, the complexity grows. And so we need very good control on the error term, and that's only going to be given to us assuming some form of, yeah, of uh, the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, on the other hand, what do we do when we uh, average over primes? Well, uh, what we need there is a exponential mixing of the random walks in V of, a, of T. So as before, um, you know, how do you count how many representations you have of, of gamma into a fixed G of P? G of P is G over FP, finite group. Counting such representations amounts to compute the number of points um, in G to the K that satisfy these relations. So if these relations are random, you will be able to achieve this count if you know the probability that the random walk goes back to the identity in G of FP. But L and P, so L is the length of the world, length of the random walk, and L and P are related to each other. So to, to, to affect this, we need a very good equidistribution rate of a random walk in G of FP. So and this is another way to say that G of FP is an expander graph with respect to a generating set X1, XK. If we know that G of FP is an expander, we know that the random walk equidistributes very fast, it's as fast as uh, the log of the size of the group, log P more or less in this case. And so, and so then we'll be able to, to do this count. But we need this equidistribution to take place not for a given generating set that you reduce mod p, but for arbitrary generating set in, in G of fp. So we need, we need the x1, xk to be arbitrary, arbitrary point in G of fp. So this goes back to my lecture on Friday where I, we proved, I proved there on Friday that um, there is a uniform bound on, on the expansion of arbitrary k graphs of G of fp. And so this is where we, yeah, so th th we need this bound. So I, I write down the, the computation here. So it's a, this double counting, you see, and you can average over the, pri over the Ws. It's the same thing as taking the sum over the generators of the probability of return to the identity. But if you know you are an expander, then you understand this probability. And so and that, that's how it works. And, uh, and so the, the last slide is this. So um, this is a theorem I stated at the end on, on Friday where we uh, show that you have uniform expansion, except maybe for a small set of primes. But luckily, this small set of primes is, is just, just enough to be able to prove our case. Even though we, we don't have uniform expansion for all primes, we have to discard this small set, but this set is sufficiently small that it does not affect this double count. So that's it. Uh, yes, thank you. So, so this is um, because we. So, for this, we use the classification of finite simple groups for the consequence of this. So, we 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 show that the action um, is multi trans multiply transitive at least six transitive. And the, the way to show that it's six transitive is again this count, uh, maybe this count. And uh, any six transitive group is, has to be ultimate. I'm not sure. Um, does it make sense if we uh, replace work with generalized work and identity generalized, for example, in the context of uh, uniform people permutation? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. It's, it's a bit less natural to introduce constants in the words.
Do you have explicit uh, example for uh, the case two beyond uh, key equal two? Um, yeah, so I gave you a few, yeah, um, but um, not with k uh, equal to equal two. Okay, yeah. two. Um, but you know, if you take um, higher rank lattice, then it's okay. Yeah, but will you have r equal k minus one? But no, you no, I, that I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.